my charity. I, I wanna thank my wife. Yo, to my people cutting hair in the shops, thank God it's. Okay, BLA Talk 1580, jam-packed day today, handling breaking news, Friedman Friday, and so much more. Uh, we'll be talking with Gene Shalak in a moment, but uh, right now it is a uh, pleasure to welcome the former managing attorney at the law offices of Johnny Cochran, Jr. He did that before leaving to start his own firm, the Douglas Law Group, back in 1998, that firm known now as Douglas Hicks. Um, and he's represented people like Michael Jackson, Jamie Foxx, Queen Latifah, uh, NFL safety Darren Sharper. Of course, he was part of the famous O.J. Simpson uh, defense team, the uh, dream team. Attorney Carl Douglas, welcome. Dominique, it's always a pleasure to be on your show. Thanks for having me again. You know what? I, I appreciate you because I know CNN, NBC, and everybody else is calling you right now, uh, tugging on your coattails, but um, you always make time for us, and whether it was street science, front page, and now uh, first things first, so I appreciate that. What was the first thing that went through your mind when you heard that uh, you're probably one of your most famous clients, for sure, O.J. Simpson? Certainly your most controversial case has to be. O.J. Simpson had died at the age of 76 from prostate cancer. Well, you know, the first thought was that he died as a relatively young man. Um, he's only eight years older than me. So his death really shook me and saddened me. It made me go back to thinking about Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. And it also made me think about his four children who will now continue on without their father. Yeah, um, it, there's a lot of sadness all the way around. Um, and it's weird for me, honestly, having, you know, just moved to L.A. at the time when all of this went down to see the way it's being reimagined, re I guess you could call it revisionist history that's happening in the telling of this case. What stands out to you most in that sense? You know, the one thing that marvels me even now is when you talk about the subject of the O.J. Simpson trial or his legacy, Everyone has an opinion. <laughs> Even 30 years later, everyone wants to talk about it. Everyone has questions to ask. Everyone has an opinion. And there are a few things, Dom, that have such lasting impact on Americans as the travails of the O.J. Simpson legacy. So it's been fascinating to me that no matter what's going on, everyone wants to talk about O.J. Simpson. Yeah, it, it's um, actually caught me by surprise how um, pervasive the conversation has been on all the news channels. It's just, I mean, I know this was this trial was impactful, but like you said, it was a long time ago. Um, the fact that it still seems to be so raw for so many people actually did surprise me. Yeah, it's, it, it shows that the more things change, the more they remain the same. Because of our former president, we are as divided a country along racial lines that I have can ever remember, probably more stark than even in 1995 and those pictures of reactions from white and black listeners I believe, regrettably, that we are more balkanized and more divided now than even back then. Mm. Do you have any regrets about that trial, your, your, you know, your part in it or yeah. how things played out um, legally, personally, professionally? Absolutely not. You've got to understand, Dom, um, one, I was simply an employee in Johnny L. Cochran's <laughs> office, so I was doing whatever he wanted me to do. But also, as a trial lawyer, I want to be there at the free throw line with the ball in my hand taking that last shot. Any trial lawyer worth his salt wants to be in the middle of the biggest cases and he wants the world to the, he or she 
wants the world to see his skill, and then, when successful, wants to revel in the victory. And so I am proud, honored, and my life has been forever changed because of my success as part of the criminal defense team representing O.J. Simpson. And, you know, it's, it's a lot has been made about, um, at least in, in the black spaces where I hang out, that we are not giving enough support, condolence, um, space and grace to O.J. Simpson's children. He has four, two boys, two girls. And sometimes with all of the conversations that swirl around him, you kind of lose sight of the fact that now his four children will continue without their father. No matter what you think about O.J., O.J. was was loving to his children. He had good relationships with them, particularly toward the end. So you have to, in some manner of your humanity, feel for them for having lost their father. And... I mean, for sure, that uh, condolences to the family. I heard some conversation on cable news about how his estate will be impacted by the outstanding judgment uh, in that civil case uh, that he, uh, the money, the millions that he owes to the the family of his former wife, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, the other um, person who was murdered on that, that day. Um, will that, those judgments be paid out of whatever he has, how does that work? And and then will his children uh, have an inheritance or how does that work? Or will that debt follow them? Um, they were indicating that this was going to play out in probate, but I was kind of thinking probably not. He, he likely would have a trust. Correct. I'm not a probate lawyer, so I want to offer that caveat initially. But I know that the Goldmans have been unsuccessful for the last 30 years to secure more than perhaps $100,000 or more of what was then a $33 million verdict. I know that OJ had smart business accountants and lawyers that created estate vehicles that protected his assets and protected his, his reserve accounts in the banks. I know that for the last 25 or 30 plus years, OJ would receive a monthly stipend because of his involvement with the National Football League and there's Player Association, as well as the, the, the Screen Actors Guild. So that money that he would receive, even when he was in jail for those nine years, continued to grow. They are a part of his estate and I do not believe that the Goldman or Brown families would be able to access any of that money now after his death when they were unsuccessful to get it while he was alive. Attorney Carl Douglas, um, what's the question everyone asks you? The one that, you know, <laughs> the question that you're tired of being asked. <laughs> I'm not tired of being asked, but everyone asks, okay, Carl, now that he's gone, tell us the truth. What do you think? Did he do it or not? <laughs> See, I knew it would be the question I'm not crazy enough to ask. So, <laughs> what do but you think? My answer is always the same. Da da my answer is always the same. One, the prosecution wasn't responsible for proving whether O.J. was guilty or innocent. The prosecution accepted the burden of proving O.J. guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And... I will go to my grave, Dom, believing two things. One, that they failed in that burden of proving him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And two, regrettably, members of the Los Angeles Police Department messed with the evidence to convict someone whom they thought was guilty. I'm a civil libertarian. I don't care what you do if the police can monkey with the evidence and lead to the conviction of O.J. Simpson, then none of us are safe. So that's probably the answer that I always give, because clearly I believe that, and I will continue holding that view to my grave. 
Your your friend uh, Linda J is on the phone. She was at the trial. I think every single day. Were you Linda J? Uh, she's written a book called "I Was There." It's not just about OJ. It's about the many, 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 many important historical things that she was a witness and a, a documenter of. Hi, Linda J. Linda, you there? Yeah. I, I, can you hear me? No, I do. Me, yes. Yes. Uh huh. Welcome. You hear me now? Yes. Okay, welcome. Okay, yes. Hey, I wasn't there every day, but I was there a lot of those days in the, what, nine months or so? so. <laughs> yeah, I was there. Do you see things differently? Yeah. I mean, you, if I remember correctly, you did not think he was guilty, right? Well, you know, I didn't think he was guilty. I just basically didn't know for sure because I wasn't there, first of all, you know, and <laughs> nobody else, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I felt that, you know, like Carl just said, the police monkey with the evidence. And this is what I was looking at because every time you look around, you know, they had blood that didn't, you know, didn't showed up in different places. They, they took vials of blood and you didn't see that when when it came back you didn't see all the blood that was supposed to be in the file and you saw blood drifting everywhere that wasn't supposed to be in there and it looked kind of you know it looked fishy so i i didn't i didn't trust the evidence i'll ask this question to linda J and and carl douglas you know i think i feel like a lot of white folks are are still angry and certainly back then were just enraged about the way the black community supported O.J. Simpson and celebrated his um, not guilty verdict. Um, do you see it differently now? Do you think that we were wrong to do that? Do you think that you would, um, living how you've lived your life and knowing what you know now, you would have um, responded in the same way? And start with you, Linda J. You know what, Dominique, I, that's a good question because, see, I'm looking at now, you, you know, since the George Floyd killings and, you know, Michael Brown and Sandra Brand and, you know, with the police killings in the last 10 years that's been videotaped, um, I see white people now, some of them are saying, you know what, what I know now, I didn't know then. I tried to tell some white people that was out there, out there at, the court, at the courthouse that I, you know, befriended or befriended me that things were going on, they just could not believe it with the police. So now I think some of them, more of them are kind of, you know, suspect in maybe what happened with the OJ case. So, you know, I just think a lot of things have just pretty much flipped. Carl Douglas, do you think, do you, when you reflect on how we as a community mostly, because not everyone's a monolith, responded, mm -hmm. do you think we should have or could have done it differently? You know, Dominique, two things come to mind. One, as I've mm -hmm. looked at the coverage of O.J. Simpson's death, I'm the only member of the defense team who ever speaks on behalf of what we were doing as defense lawyers. Johnny's no longer alive, and I feel it my obligation to, to uplift the memory and the legacy of Johnny L. Cochran, Jr. The reaction mm -hmm. that you saw then were visceral. They weren't plotted. They weren't um, thought out. And that was the culmination of decades of feelings by Black Americans that the justice system did not work for us. I tell all of my colleagues, my white colleagues and friends, it had nothing to do with O.J. Simpson, the celebrity per se, but the image of a black man successfully being defended by black lawyers was a visceral reaction that moment that I understand and I embrace. I mean, yeah, it's, yes. a, it's like a proxy yes. war, right? A proxy war mm -hmm. on race in this mm -hmm. nation, a proxy war on our justice system, um, keeping us on schedule. When we come forward, I, you know, I, I want to just uh, wrap, get some final remarks from each of you, um, and mm -hmm. we'll go to our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, but I, one of my first guests when I moved to Los Angeles was Paul Mooney, which puts things in perspective of where I was positioned as I'm newly arriving in L.A. in the middle of this O.J. Simpson controversy. Listen. I'm seeing that she brought back the O.J. trial. That trial was deep. 
because they had Johnny. Oh, Johnny, you know Johnny. Hey, Johnny talks more shit than than Jesse Jackson, than Messy Jesse, and Jesse got messy. We had a perfect record to Jesse got messy. <laughs> Telling us to stay out the bush. No, you stay out the bush, nigga. But Johnny, don't Johnny talk shit? Baby, Johnny can get you off. That nigga rhyme, they gotta let nigga go. That nigga can rhyme you out of jail. He got he got uh, OJ off, but that glove that don't fit or quit. Nicole was a hoe. You gotta let him go. That nigga will rock. He got Puffy off. What's Puffy change his name to what? Yeah. Oh, he should have changed it to Lucky Nick, because he was. He rhymed him out. The gun wasn't in the car, it wasn't at the bar. That OJ trial was deep, wasn't it? And white folks can talk to animals. They wore that dog out. Was it a Kita, a Japanese dog? Did they wear that dog out? Come on, we'll give you a show like last year, a gentle Ben, O Yellow. Come on, you saw OJ do it. Say OJ did it. Come on, dog. The dog tried. Oh, oh. That's it, that's that dog. Come on, you're almost there. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, you're almost there. Come on, dog. You can do it. Oh, 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 oh. OJ, say it. It was a Japanese Akita. Couldn't pronounce the J. Oh, oh. Couldn't pronounce that goddamn J. If it would have been an English terrier, we'd have been in trouble. Yes, it was OJ Simpson. The nigga that you call the juice. It was very violent. There was blood everywhere. A safe place to go loud. loud. A great place for progressive politics. KBLA Talk 1580. I'm going out with the girls this weekend. Nails, done. Outfit, stunner. And my skin, I know it's going to be glowing because I glammed up my shower routine with new Olay Indulgent Moisture Body Wash. It smells so luxurious and moisturizes deep into my skin with its super rich, creamy lather that's bursting with vitamin B3. So my skin glows and my confidence grows. Try new Olay Indulgent Moisture Body Wash for glowing skin in just 14 days. One in three children born today will get diabetes. This sad prediction by the Centers for Disease Control will come true if millions of Americans don't improve their lifestyles, especially by changing what they eat, how much they eat, and how active they are every day. Every 23 seconds, another American gets diabetes. Stop diabetes before it starts. To learn more, contact the American Diabetes Association or download our free diabetes education programs at learningaboutdiabetes.org. Thanks for waking up with Dominique De Prima on KBLA Talk 1580. And um, Attorney Carl Douglas is on the line with us, as is Linda J. Linda J. wrote the book, um, I was there, and she was there for much of the O.J. Simpson trial. Of course, uh, attorney Carl Douglas was there. It was his job. He was part of yes. the dream team. Linda J., um, I, I so appreciate you calling in. I know you've been dodging people <laughs> and want to talk to you about this. <laughs> um, yeah. What do you I'm... wish people know knew? What do you remember most looking okay. back, and what do you wish people would consider or know yeah. as we talk about this now? What I want people to know is that, you know, when we all celebrated, and you, you know, like it was down racial lines, it was basically a lot of people um, celebrated a win for Johnny. And then the, on the other half of the black people were celebrating, this is the first time that we had the financial means to stand against the system because we got so many black men in prison that could not fight their way. They didn't have the money to fight for, you know, for their freedom. And O.J. did. And that's what a lot of people celebrate. We wasn't celebrating two white people being killed. We were celebrating that win for Johnny. We were celebrating a win just to see people that look like us, you know, finally beat the system. So I just want people to know that. And I just want people to, you know, come together. This is what I still want. I want us to come together because we're in a dire moment right now. Times have changed, but some of the th things that's happening now, it's some old stuff that happened long time ago, you know, and we just got to, you know, we just got to, you know, stay together and come together. Yeah, it's a great message, Linda J. Um, Attorney Carl Douglas, what uh, what do you wish people would consider in this conversation today that we're missing? There is value 
in continuing to talk to people even when you disagree with them. We have regrettably gone to our own separate corners in America, only talking to others who agree with us. And that's why there are these divisions that are so stark and so bold. And it is a time like this, because everyone, Dom, over the age of 40, remembers where they were when the O.J. Simpson verdict was read. I'm older than most, and I remember where I was when John F. Kennedy was shot and killed. Mm -hmm. It's one of those similar moments. And we can use Mm -hmm. this time and this conversation, like Linda is saying, to continue to, to talk because only through communications with others who think differently are we ever able to, 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 to mend and heal this divide that affects us right now in America. Mm. Um, well, I appreciate you guys, you know, spending time with me this morning. I mean, that we can talk about this all day. I know they are going to be talking about it all day. I was happy to see some of the more measured um, commentary because uh, I remember, you know, I was I was at the beat back then. I had my show Street Science and just mm-hmm. the, the, the reason I say proxy war is because I feel like <clears throat> the trial was used as an excuse to bash black people as a mm-hmm. group of, of folks. And that's the feedback I was getting. People were angry because we didn't get to tell our side of the story. People, we we were all OJ. We were all um, whatever the stereotypes right. were that were attributed. So I'm glad to see a little mm-hmm. bit more nuanced conversation. But I do think we are in a delicate moment, as you say, Linda J. Um, especially in this election mm-hmm. year. Yeah. Go ahead, Dominique. Can I just say this? Yes. Can I uh, ask for a special prayer from your listeners for Big Money, aka Marsh Griffin? Um, he's in the hospital Absolutely. right now. He's been sick in the hospital for four days, and we're just asking your prayer worries out there. You know him from front page. Please give a shout out, give a prayer to Big Bunny because he needed. He's in need of prayer right now. Yes. and that's a good friend of mine. In a long time, thirty year, thirty two year friend of mine, okay? and an activist. Mine as well. Mine as well. Mine oh, as well. I didn't know okay. you were friends with. Uh, I and I just saw him. I just saw him at Ben Crump's event. The. Uh, Equal Justice Awards, Big Money was there looking dapper. So I hope you get well soon, uh, Morris Griffin. And, you know, yeah, we'll send out a collective prayer. Um, We got a minute right here. Carl Douglas, what do you want to leave us with? You know, continue to hope for a better tomorrow to all your listeners. Uh, While I say the more the things change, the more they stay the same, I continue to remain positive and hopeful for a better tomorrow. All right. Yes, uh, that's right. I agree, Carl. <laughs> and, I agree. Uh, and yeah, and, and, and thank you for sharing your experiences. Uh, Linda J., it's great to hear from you. I, I Don't be a stranger. We love you around here. I won't be. <laughs> and Carl Douglas, thank you for being, uh, you know, always part of almost like, a, you know, our secret weapon here at KBLA Talk 1580. We really appreciate you. Thank you, my sister. Always a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, Yes, indeed. A pleasure to have you. Um, We are going to have uh, another robust conversation when we come forward. Joining me in the studio this morning, another lawyer. (laughs) She's a justice advocate, got her um, JD at Pepperdine and uh, graduated from Spelman. She's the Dean of Students Diversity and Belonging over there at uh, Pepperdine. And we'll continue this conversation when we come forward after news, traffic and sports only right here. She's reclaiming her time on KBLA Talk 1580. More First Things First with Dominic DePrima when we come forward. I'm Mike Moore. Here's the latest from the Black Information Network. Caitlyn Jenner has just two words after the death of O.J. Simpson. Good riddance. She posted that on social media Thursday morning after the news broke the African-American former NFL star had died from cancer at the age of 76. Jenner has long believed Simpson was responsible for the murders of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ronald Goldman back in 1994. A reminder now for taxpayers when it comes to charitable deduction rules. The Internal Revenue Service says those who itemize must remember that donations must be to a qualified organization. Other rules include the donation must have been during the proper tax year, there must be a record of it, and the total deduction cannot be more than 60% of your adjusted gross income. 
And that's the latest. I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Some people just know the best rate for you is a rate based on you with Allstate, not one based on anyone else. So if you drive safely, you could save money. Good to know. Visit Allstate.com or call for a quote today. Is this the title? This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. The Clippers will play Dallas in the first round of the NBA playoffs. The teams locked up the fourth and fifth spot in the Western Conference standings. First round games tip off April 20th. The Lakers will play Golden State in the play-in round next Tuesday. As the 10th seed in the West, the Lakers will have to win two games to make the playoffs. If they lose to Golden State, they are done for the season. The NBA wraps up the regular season schedule this weekend. The Lakers are at Memphis tonight and New Orleans on Sunday. The Clippers are at home tonight against Utah. Tiger Woods had a respectable first round Thursday at the Masters. He finished one under after completing 13 rounds. He's six strokes behind leader Bryson DeChambeau. Play was suspended Thursday because of darkness. Woods will have to finish the last five holes today, then play a full 18 in the second round. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. You're out here. We don't believe in victimhood. We believe in raising our voices, amplifying black voices in the climate conversation. We're KBLA Talk 1580. We ask seniors how to prevent Medicare scams. My best advice, if you get a phone call, do not talk to the person. These people are well-trained. Don't talk to them. They don't know me. They're just trying to scam me. Don't be fooled. Hang up. Just hang up. Never give out your Medicare number. They're going to get your number to put in a false claim. If I get a call from someone, I don't pick up the phone. And should I pick up the phone and ask for information, then I hang up. How do you detect Medicare fraud? Just like I check my credit card statements, I check my Medicare statements monthly. Scammers can get a hold of your number, order medical devices through your account, and you're not even going to know about it if you don't look at your statement. Check your statement every month. If you get your statement and you see something that you know you did not have done, you report it. Call your senior Medicare patrol. To report Medicare fraud, call the senior Medicare patrol at 855-613-7080. Hey there, Los Angeles. This is James Lucky Jr., publisher and editor of Los Angeles News Observer. Are you hungry for news that matters to you and the African-American communities of Los Angeles? Well, buckle up, because we got the scoop you've been craving. Stay in the know and never miss a beat with our free weekly publications conveniently available near you. Or hop on the digital wave and become an exclusive subscriber at OGNSC.com. Don't forget to join the party on Instagram and Twitter at OGNSCINC for behind the scenes access and sizzling updates. No more FOMO. Let's stay informed, connected, and empowered together. We knew you'd stick around. This is LA's home for progressive talk radio. Welcome back to KBLA Talk 1580. And uh, another lawyer, but I won't be asking her about OJ. <laughs> She's a justice advocate. Um, and uh, she is, um, she was recently appointed to the State Bar of California's Council on Access, Fair, and uh, Fairness. Um, she is, a, as I said, a Pepperdine graduate and now um, is at Pepperdine. Uh, and it's so good to see you again. Uh, great to see you, Dean Shalak Richards. Good to see you as Wait, well, Dominic. And now it's Shalak Richards. Guinness. Guinness. Yes, Guinness. Yes, I should say that so that I don't get in trouble Guinness. when I get home tonight. Yes, congrats. <laughs> thank you. I think last time I saw you, you were single. Now you're married. I am, yes. You're glowing. No, oh, thank you. That's so kind. <laughs> so um, you're Dean of Students, Diversity, and Belonging. Yes. And um, before we run out of time, because I get to talking, you guys have some really important programs that are super crucial at this juncture of life that we're in. We do, and thank you. Um, one of the things that I think, and I actually will tie this to a couple of conversations you've been having this morning that I was privileged to hear, is we've been focused on, as you were saying with Rashid earlier, policy, not just program. And we've been focused on structural changes. And so we have implemented, and I'm so thankful we actually just put out offers for our third year of 
are HBCU scholars. And so these are students who graduate from any of the 106 accredited historically black colleges or universities in the country who receive a full tuition scholarship for wow. all three years. It's the second highest scholarship that the, the law school offers. Um, and because we know that that makes a critical change and has a critical impact on their ability to practice law to do so, many of our students are first generation. So they're the first ones in their families to go to college or law school. And being able to hit the ground running is so powerful for them. <laughs> and, and while you're running, not carry a giant well, student loan. Exactly. Yeah. And to be able to go into the type of work they want to. So one of the key criteria for us in awarding this scholarship, after all their amazing academic accomplishments and everything, is we ask them how they plan to use their law degree to serve underserved communities. They don't have to be like the late, great Johnny Cochran that we were just hearing from Carl Douglas, but what are they planning to do that will lift up people who have been traditionally held down across society? That is a key factor for us, and we are so excited that, as I said, we just made offers um, to offer up to five of those full tuition scholarships. A full ride to law school is more than a notion. Yes. And That's and that was our purpose, that it's not just, you know, we're putting on a, a law school day at one of the right. schools, a program, right? But that there's something that is entrenched in our policy now in our structure that will continue and will continue to benefit these students at, as you said, a very crucial juncture in society where we need them more than other. I mean, honestly, that's like total life-changing opportunity to get a full ride to Pepperdine Law. That's almost a direct quote from one of our first scholars who's actually graduating in, I'm looking at the date, a month and five days. And she said, this is life-changing and I can now do the work that I want to do. And I'm going to give her a shout out, Jordan Washington. She's a graduate of Howard University. Yay, Jordan Washington. <laughs> um it's funny, too, because, I mean, it, there was been a lot of conversation on Instagram and elsewhere about mm -hmm. Charlemagne the God saying that a lot of that most diversity programs don't do jack and they don't have an impact. It's really just window dressing. And I know there are some that are that way. But when you talk about, you know, uh, HBCU scholars, five now five lawyers starting out careers in just one year. In just one year. Uh, without this massive burden and with a commitment to serving their communities, that's not just life-changing for them. That can be a game-changer for an entire city, neighborhood, or town. And families, right? We recognize that as particularly Black people move up in sort of their wealth accumulation, it trickles and benefits their entire family. So yes, you know, I understand Charlemagne and where he may be coming from, but the truth of the matter is... You don't know is, what he's talking about. That You might understand. I'm trying understand to be gracious. It. I know, but, but I don't have to. Okay, yeah. But, you know, but the truth of the matter is that when our offices are properly funded and properly staffed, they have great impact. They serve first-generation students. They serve military veterans. They serve women, single mothers, underhoused people. I work every day to help and support and actually support students who are facing struggles that people who typically go to law school do not face and that are not at front of mind. I have students who, if their laptop breaks down, they do not know if they are going to be able to pay rent or buy a new laptop. And I promise getting through law school in 2024 without a functional laptop is tantamount to academic suicide. And I'm not overstating. No, absolutely. And our office gets the funding to say, okay, this student is from a lower socioeconomic status. We have an emergency fund administered now through the university that provides them with the support. You don't have to choose between paying your rent and being able to go to class. We will make sure you can do both. Interesting that you brought up first generation. We were just talking about this in terms of the dream for all um, you know, loan and program that's out now, apply. Um, <laughs> but because one of the requirements was first, not just first time, but first generation. So explain what that means. So first generation means that you're the first person typically in your immediate family. So people are thinking parents, maybe grandparents to go to college or in the law school context, we say or law school, but they're meaning the first person in your family to go to a post-secondary experience. To break that barrier. So in, the, in that, in the dream for all, it's first in generation to go 
buy a house. Yes. In this case, it's go to law school. Yes. And um, are so are those part of the? Those are two different programs, or they're part of the same program? The HBCU scholars and the first generation. They're two different programs, although we've seen that so far for our scholars, they've almost all been first generation, either college or law school. Wow. And so there's an intersection there. But our first generation work is completely separate. And what we are doing and we are launching, and I would invite your listeners and those who are interested in partnering with us and supporting, we are going to be launching a first generation students academic support program. Not saying that they are not as academically qualified, but there are some things they just don't know because their dad isn't telling them you should be doing this or you should think about how to, to pass a law school exam in this kind of way. And so we are stepping in to fill that gap, to get them across and equip them to be as academically successful as we know they can be. I mean, honestly, as a mom who sent my child to a very elite um, elementary and for a time high school, you see it. Yeah. You know, my, 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 Dad, my mom didn't graduate college, but she's a scholar. My dad's a scholar. We have an advantage mm -hmm. coming from academic families that not everybody has. And it's not a level playing field. It doesn't have anything to do with their aptitude. It has to do with the resources at home. You know, my kid was in class with... You know, people whose dads were rocket scientists. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to help them with their math a little better than I could, for example. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I I am so grateful for the sacrifices my family made. But my maternal grandfather is functionally illiterate. He can wow. basically just sign his name and phone numbers. Perhaps the smartest man I've ever met. Of course. But functionally illiterate. My mother, after I was born, was the first one in her family to graduate from university. And she has a picture of walking across the stage with me holding her hand. My father, the, after I graduated actually, completed his undergraduate degrees and, his, and just completed a master's degree. And I think that what happens there is even for them, me going across my stages, that I was able to motivate the rest of my family. So my cousins now, my sister, say, we can do that. And they have someone to call to say, what's it like? How can you help mm -hmm. me? And that is life changing, again, for generations and for communities. And so what we want to do and the importance of our offices is making sure that those types of general generational impacts can continue. And there are many people doing that good work. But to be very frank, we're also being hindered by the politicization yeah. of our work. And you know, I was going to ask you that. I, don't know. I was giving you I the don't, segue, I, Dominique. I don't know how far to push you on that because I know it's, you know, it's, it's controversial. Mm -hmm. um, right now but there is a very i want to call it a crusade right now by some conservative forces in this country to outlaw diversity equity and inclusion not just discourage but literally make it against the law yeah well i mean i think you can say that fairly we see that in texas that i believe it was sp 17 or 117 that passed that outlawed those that work and the result of that last week it was announced ut austin laid off just under 60 people who do diversity related work about an hour and a half ago it was announced ut dallas will be laying off and closing their offices and laying off or repurposing approximately 40 people by the end of this month that includes people whose work was around maternal support people whose work was around housing insecurity, people whose work was around food resourcing, people whose work was around first generation work, people whose work was around administering scholarships that were funded by external people to the university, not just federal funds or state funds. And so we, I don't think it's beyond the pale to say there is a real effort to stymie these offices and to pull back our work and are we fortunate perhaps that we're in California and maybe are hopefully not going to face some of that sort of legislative? Yes, but that doesn't mean that all of us shouldn't be joining together and supporting our colleagues across the country, recognizing that what happens in Texas, what happens in Florida, what happens in Georgia impacts all of us. Yeah, and um, I also think there's a piece, well, I'll ask you to address this when we come forward, mm -hmm about demonizing and creating misinformation around what DEI even is. When Elon Musk tweeted, DEI mm. must die, it became a euphemism for other things. I want to talk about what it is, what it isn't, when we come forward on KBLA Top 1580. More of First Things First with Dominique DePrima when we come forward.
There are many healthcare organizations serving our community. Not all are dedicated to community partnerships that educate, build trust, inspire hope, and improve outcomes. Providence has a robust community outreach program and has dedicated $50 million over the next five years to support organizations addressing health disparities in local communities of color. Examples of this commitment include the Biddy Mason Community Wellness Center on the first AME campus, providing medical screenings, mental health therapy, nutrition, and culturally sensitive holistic classes. The Black Mamas Glow and Peer Support Group that focuses on maternal mental health, birth planning, and social support. Providence is committed to building trusted partnerships with community organizations to better understand and dismantle structural, racial, and cultural barriers to better health. During Minority Health Month, Providence is sponsoring Health for a Better World. Informative conversations with Providence health professionals on Urban Family Focus every Saturday in April at 7 a.m. To find a Providence Health System facility near you, log on to Providence.org. Right now at Macy's, it's time for a spring refresh. Shop our great shoe sale and save 30 to 40% off Tommy Hilfiger, Madden Girl, and more top names. And take 35 to 70% off during our diamond sale for a little sparkle that goes with everything. Plus, get our lowest prices of the season with 20 to 60% off furniture, mattresses, and more specials. Download the app for even more great deals at Macy's. Savings off sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. Imagine with me here for a minute the most beautiful panoramic setting. Maybe it's an endless ocean, waves crashing on a beach, or a crystal clear mountain lake, peaceful and quiet. Or maybe it's just little kids playing in the park down the street. Wherever your imagination takes you, now imagine right smack in the middle of this perfect picture, a piece of litter. Just one piece right there in the middle of it all. Doesn't exactly fit, does it? In fact, even though it's just one piece, now it's all you can see. That one piece ruins everything. And that's the thing about litter. It doesn't take much to ruin everything. One thing's for sure, it simply does not belong anywhere in California. So here's the good news. If we work together, we will change it. We don't have to let litter, even just one piece, ruin your perfect picture. Not anymore, not ever again. Clean California, zero litter is the goal. Brought to you by Caltrans and CleanCA.com. Talk radio lately that sounds anything like this. We didn't think so. You're listening to Unapologetically Progressive KBLA Talk 1580. Dean Shalak Richards Guinness, yeah. Mrs. Guinness now um, joining us. And uh, you're with uh, Pepperdine, um, the Caruso School of Law there. Um, and the, the initiatives that you guys are doing are amazing if people are interested in trying to apply or have their kids or grandies apply to hbcu scholars or the first gen how do you how do we get in the pipeline for that yeah so the first thing i will say is if anyone wants to just learn more about what we're doing generally they should go to law.pepperdine.edu slash diversity there's a lot of information there. Almost all of our events that we hold during the academic year are open to the public. So someone could register and join us either in person or online. We've had a Race in the Law series. We've had a Reimagining Justice series. YouTube videos of those are available online. We invite people to join us. The good thing about our two scholars programs is no additional application needed. Mm. When someone applies to the law school and they indicate on their application, either we have a question asking if they're first generation, they can check that box off. If they indicate if they graduated from an HBCU, they are automatically considered for these scholarships. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's we so want to remove all the barriers that we can and make it easy for people. And I am here to support anyone who needs it. My assistant director for diversity and belonging, Atisha Nock, is also here. Our contact information is on that website, law.pepperdine.edu slash diversity. I, it's, it feels like my second name now to say that. <laughs> um, they can find and email us and engage, not just if they want someone to attend or you know take advantage of those programs, but if they'd like to participate, if they want to engage and think about other things that we can do, community partnerships, we encourage all of our scholars to engage in community service. And so anything that they think it would be great to partner with and to do, because that's the other arm of our office and many DEI offices. There's a report that came out in 2021 by Lisa Taylor and Belinda Dantley that surveyed DEI professionals across law schools and found that for 89% of DEI professionals, 
their this work was just one part of their job. So for most of us, we're doing multiple jobs in the building. You said it, my title has many parts, right? We're doing many things. But within that, our offices work in admissions, of course, and that's where everyone goes. But we also work in student services. We work in alumni services. We work in community partnerships. We were able to, through my office, create a great relationship with, I've got to give her a shout out, Capri Maddox, who you know very yeah, well. LA Civil Rights, absolutely. Yes, yeah. LA Civil Rights. And so we've worked with them and we have had an intern there this year being a law clerk intern with her office and that is because of relationships that my office forged with her great Pepperdine alum so I've got to say it and that is what we're seeking to do to create community relationships that move things forward and that again dispel the myth that DEI offices are just window dressing that they are incompetent that you mentioned Charlemagne earlier saying they don't do anything well when properly resourced and properly staffed, we actually do a great deal, much of it that people don't see. And and that's the thing I was thinking. I, I want to make sure we get to what DEI is and it isn't. I think there's a lot of unintended consequences that these conservatives are not seeing that are going to harm their own constituents and their own communities. You mentioned single moms. First generation doesn't have to be black brown or anybody I mean, absolutely not no one in your family's gone to college so actually at my institution we've been looking and for since we started tracking first gen about three or four years ago the majority of our first of our military veterans are first generation law students or college students who have served their country this country and are now being able to go to school and if my office is removed support for veterans support for first generation students like them are gone and i would say very strongly that the majority of those who are against the ei offices say they are very strongly in favor of the military and don't realize that type of consequence yeah it's and it's it's can be quite devastating so in in my opinion this is not dean uh, Guinness, <laughs> in my opinion, DEI is now a euphemism for the N-word. It when is. When in Baltimore, you know, the, the bridge gets hit by a ship, it's the DEI mayor. What does that mean? It means he's a black mayor. Yes. We don't like black mayors. Let's talk about what DEI is and what it isn't, because I think, you know, that this mis and disinformation sometimes permeates our own communities and we start spouting off these talking points that are undermining our best interests. Absolutely. So here's the thing, right? DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, as you say, Dominique, has been used as a euphemism. Before that, it was woke. Before that, it was affirmative action. Before that, it's CRT, political, yeah. political, politically correct, right? right All yeah, of these yeah. are things where people feel like they can't say the word that they want to say, <laughs> <laughs> that, to be truthful. Right. And so DEI is, uh, you, it's the acronym for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and now many people like myself have added on belonging, and it is simply tracking forward. What does it look like to hold institutions accountable for the values they said they have? They say they have values of fairness. They say they have values of access. They say that they are open to all and want all people to be able to, in the case of higher education, matriculate successfully, graduate, be out in the workforce, have an impact on the world. These are offices specifically charged to make sure that that happens, to redress historical inequities and bring people forward. This is not about putting, quote unquote, unqualified people into positions. It is not about putting, quote unquote, unqualified people forward. I saw people saying Don Staley was a DEI coach. And I was like, well, I challenge you to get up on a court beside her any given day of the week. Yeah, right. You know, and DEI so I champion. <laughs> that's not what it is. And if I may just take a moment, I believe in giving the shout out. I want to point people to Dr. Sean Harper at USC. I know I'm sorry, Pepperdine, I'm mentioning another institution, but the USC Race and Equity Center recently released a report, Truth About DEI on College Campuses. It is groundbreaking and it is directly in response to the March 7th congressional hearings about DEI work on college campuses. And it is breaking down for every point said in those hearings about what DEI is not. It is saying here is the actual truth. The actual truth is that, sure, like any other industry, we should be held to standards. We should be critical and engaged and thinking about who is doing good work. But, and I would, this is not Sean, this is me saying this, I actually think that it is a component of racism 
and sexism that we hold DEI officers to higher standards because they are typically women of color who are put into those roles. And we hold, as we know, women of color to standards that we do not hold other people to. We perpetuate a superhuman complex and look for ways to pull them down, to pull ourselves down. And we need to be able to say the same standard we would hold anybody else to. That's what we do here. Mm, that's a really good point. Now, sorry, I'm getting going. We have five minutes left. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll have to come back. I, I'm sorry we got interrupted by breaking news, but we that's what we do. Absolutely. Um, and my condolences to those touched and impacted by um, the, the recent loss that was just being discussed. Yeah. I think um, when you talk about, you know, DEI being a lot of black women and, and women of color, mm -hmm. um, it seems like the Hollywood exodus of those DEI executives was maybe a canary in the coal mine. Could we get to a point where, I mean, this is just, hopefully California has its blue wall, but could we get to a point where this is no longer, you know, under the banner of banning affirmative action through the Supreme Court, this is no longer something that's allowable? I think we could absolutely get to that point. Um, and I know that's sobering for many people to hear, but I believe, as many people say, that if you don't understand history, then it will repeat itself. And we could absolutely get to the point where even here in sort of our blue wall, we get comfortable and we don't recognize what's happening. And what's happening, as we've said earlier, is pushback. It's pushback that started with the Supreme Court decision, um, SFFA, Students for Fair Action versus Harvard and UNC that came out in June and has continued since then. The Wisconsin State Bar recently, just in a partial settlement, changed some of the policies around their, they had a diversity scholarship and they've changed what that criteria looks like to broaden it, which in some ways is not necessarily a bad thing, but again, dog whistles for what people don't want to say. Well, yeah, and when everyone's lined up for the same so-called program, many times, you know, black people get pushed out. Yeah. Uh, I am concerned about attacks on HBCUs. Mm -hmm. um, should I be? I think so. And listen, I am I, I am a proud Spelman alumna. Our Founders Day was yesterday, April 11th, Ooh. 1881. The best institution ever was created. I feel like I have to say that um, and, and give that shout out. And I think that if you speak with any serious HBCU alum, we'll, they'll tell you, yes, we should be concerned. Federal funding is being impacted. I'm, I'm not going to speak to p particular parties because I'm mindful of that, but I think it's important to note who promises and secures and promulgates funding for his, all of the 106 accredited historically black colleges and universities. So it's incumbent upon us as a community as a community to give that funding, but also what will keep HBCUs going is that we have to encourage our young people to attend historically black colleges. We have to tell them that it's an important place to go, that it's impactful for them. And I will tell you, Dominique, there is something special about being in a place that you know was created with you in mind, not just somewhere that's letting you come in. Oh, my mom, my dad's tapping me on the shoulder saying, <laughs> I told you so, because he wanted me to go to Howard and I stayed at San Francisco State. That said, uh, real quick here, we have a question. The person's at work. They said, can we counter the attacks on DEI by attacking the legacy admissions? Well, there are people who are attempting to do so, actually. There is a lawsuit that was brought in, I believe it was the Southern District of New York, but please don't quote me on that, lawyers. Um, we will make sure to check and have that countering legacy admissions, saying, okay, fine, if everything is solely based on quote unquote merit, right? And I attack the premise of that question because we, we were not admitting anyone who was not qualified to attend their schools, but putting that aside, if everything is based on quote unquote merit, then who your parents are shouldn't matter. If it's truly blind admissions, then it should be blind admissions. And we should not have what we call these these specialty admits. And so, yes, there have actually been suits that just started. I, it will be a couple of years at minimum before we see those come to any real place if they survive sort of the intermediary challenges. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we got a lot to talk about. You're going to have to come back, at least on the phone. We got to um, leave it there. Um, but it's, I'm we're all the more grateful for the work you're doing at Pepperdine, and I encourage everyone to go to law.pepperdine.edu slash diversity. Dean Shalak Richards, uh, Guinness, thank you. Thank for you. In. Tavis Smiley is on right now. The best of Tavis Smiley until Monday. One love. KBLA 1580 Santa Monica.
I'm Mike Moore. Here's the latest from the Black Information Network. Caitlyn Jenner has just two words after the death of O.J. Simpson. Good riddance. She posted that on social media Thursday morning after the news broke the African-American former NFL star had died from cancer at the age of 76. Jenner has long believed Simpson was responsible for the murders of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ronald Goldman back in 1994. A reminder now for taxpayers when it comes to charitable deduction rules. The Internal Revenue Service says those who itemize must remember that those Donations must be to a qualified organization. Other rules include the donation must have been during the proper tax year, there must be a record of it, and the total deduction cannot be more than 60% of your adjusted gross income. And that's the latest I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Some people just know the best rate for you is a rate based on you with Allstate not one based on anyone else. So if you drive safely, you could save money. Good to know. Visit Allstate.com or call for a quote today. Is this the title? This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. I'm a bad man. The Clippers will play Dallas in the first round of the NBA playoffs. The team's locked up the fourth and fifth spot in the Western Conference standings. First round games tip off April 20th. The Lakers will play Golden State in the play-in round next Tuesday. As the 10th seed in the West, the Lakers will have to win two games to make the playoffs. If they lose to Golden State, they are done for the season. The NBA wraps up the regular season schedule this weekend. The Lakers are at Memphis tonight and New Orleans on Sunday. The Clippers are at home tonight against Utah. Tiger Woods had a respectable first round Thursday at the Masters. He finished one under after completing 13 rounds. He's six strokes behind leader Bryson DeChambeau. Play was suspended Thursday because of darkness. Woods will have to finish the last five holes today, then play a full 18 in the second round. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Hi, I'm Tavis Smiley. And I'm Captain Mayor Emma Sharif. You have no doubt been hearing promos and expert conversations on our various weekday shows and downloading details at KBLA1580.com about our climate justice campaign, which is now in full effect. The city of Compton is pleased to partner with KBLA Talk 1580 to celebrate Earth Day 2024 as we serve, share, and help our city shine. And KBLA Talk 1580 is just as excited to join the city of Compton as we broadcast live and bring our KBLA delegation with us to help clean and beautify our community and you are invited to join